Hi, everyone. Welcome to the A6 and Z podcast. I'm Sonal. Today, we're kicking off our new series on new medium storytelling with a conversation about VR, AR, that's virtual reality and augmented reality, and beyond. And what does it mean when the celluloid that we're now working with is actually the human experience? Joining us to have this conversation, we have within co-founder and filmmaker Chris Milk, big screen founder and CEO Darshan Shankar, and we have Lytro CEO Jason Rosenthal in conversation with A16Z's Kyle Russell in a conversation that was recorded at our inaugural A16Z Summit. In this conversation, they cover everything from the challenges and potential of these new technologies to the emotional power a new medium affords. Why are we excited about putting big goggle-style computers on our faces? Uh, To understand A16Z's perspective, I think it's valuable to define terms. I don't want to assume anyone in the room has played with every gadget like I have. So uh, the big buckets to think about in terms of the emerging computing paradigms we're going to be talking about today are augmented reality, which lets you see the world differently, and virtual reality, which lets you see a different world. The former gives you superpowers. You're never going to go to an event like this and meet someone where you're pretty sure you've seen them before, but you don't remember their name. You're never going to have that awkward exchange because their LinkedIn profile is going to be uh, floating above their head once you've got, you know, glasses-sized AR headsets. Uh, Virtual reality, on the other hand, gives you true telepresence. You're going to be able to work and play from what feels like the same environment, but from any distance. It also... Uh, lets you put yourself into, more directly so than any other previous medium, into the shoes of someone else. You get to truly see the world from someone else's perspective. And so I'm joined today by three amazing entrepreneurs who are helping to make those things reality. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) To start, though, I kind of want to do a little bit of level setting. Uh, Darshan, you're a technical founder. Uh, You spent a lot of last year building Big Screen yourself. Why did now feel like the appropriate time to jump into VR as an ecosystem? Well, in 2015, I actually wasn't certain that now was the right time. That, that was a big question. Um, the question was, how good were consumer headsets going to be? How many people would buy them? Would there be a real market for it? And now is the right time because finally, after years of development, uh, both on the hardware and software side, there's actually high quality consumer VR headsets that are out there. Headsets that don't actually make people sick. Uh, at this point, it's the software that's making people sick, not the actual hardware itself. <laughs> Um, so a lot of those like low uh, kind of low level blocks are just good enough that we can start building great products, great companies uh, that just weren't really possible before just a year or two ago. Right. And so Chris, within is already one of the you know main distribution platforms that uh, our colleagues down in Hollywood are using to reach people with the VR content that they're producing. How is Hollywood thinking about the space? How are they thinking about the investments that they're making? Their expectations around what success looks like, given where the ecosystem is today. Um, yeah, how, how are they thinking about it? Well, down in Hollywood, they, uh, I, it, we're, we're starting to see a shift from um, VR pieces that are exclusively funded by marketing budgets because that's all there was to fund them with in the last year to more of the forward-thinking um, studios actually funding content for the purpose of monetizing it. Uh, you see just, I think last week, the, really the first, the first example of this, which is, uh, Fox's The Martian VR experience. Just sort of cinematic VR, sort of a game. Um, and it's priced at, I think, 1995, right? And we'll, we'll see how it does. But that, you know, these are businesses that are used to making content that costs a lot of money and then, selling it and making their money back. Um, that's not entirely possible with the current addressable market, I think, in virtual reality, when you're spending millions of dollars on, on a piece of content. Um, so, But the, the, the studios realize that they need to start exploring to be in a position that they can make really refined, high-quality content when the addressable market is actually there. To follow up a little bit, um, when I think about my media diet, it's heavily kind of bifurcated between like the blockbusters I go to every couple months in theaters and binging via Netflix, HBO Now, Hulu. Um, you, know, you, you talked about a $20 kind of uh, something that's associated with a blockbuster movie, kind of investment in that app in terms of like my buying behavior. The thing is, you could have all the money in the world. You could not start Netflix of VR today because there's no back catalog to license. Every, every 
you know, Netflix starts and they, they license a hundred something years of, of cinema and, and television and, and they, and they have a catalog. Got it. And you pay for it to access that catalog. That catalog doesn't exist in virtual reality. Everything that you're watching or experiencing is being built currently. Uh, speaking of which, Jason, at Lytro, you're building kind of the next generation of cameras that are going to be used to produce this high-end uh, cinematic storytelling-based content. Um, how are, how's the experience of VR as a cinematic medium going to evolve over the next few years? Uh, well, I think, I think nobody knows. I think that's one of the most exciting things about it. I think that if you look at one of the things that's super interesting about VR is it's kind of the first uh, medium of media where the formats aren't decide, defined and locked in from the very beginning. There's lots and lots of uh, experimentation because it's kind of the first, uh, the first way that people can interact sort of natively with the world around them that they know, uh, but in a completely virtual environment. So, but if you had to commit to a most probable future path, how are you kind of envisioning I mean, where I things think, are going to go? Yeah, so I think it's going to, I think it's going to look like uh, a lot of other forms of, uh, that, that we've seen, right? There's going to be narrative forms of VR. There's going to be uh, inherently game-like uh, experiences. There's going to be uh, live live events, and we're, where we are now. And I think you know, Chris is, and, and Darshan are doing amazing uh, jobs of running different experiments in this. Uh, nobody yet quite knows what's going to work, so everybody is trying to iterate to uh, the first version of product market fit in right. those experiences. And so, you know, uh, in order to make VR headsets, you know, provide a killer app. We're excited for gaming. We're excited for Hollywood to produce content where the entertainment value is just so high compared to what you get uh, from classic cinema that you know it kind of draws people to the platforms. Well, I, 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 would, I would question the premise okay. of that. So I think I think if you look at any new medium, right, be it the internet or mobile games or what have you, uh, it's never been uh, the, the companies that were dominant in the last form of entertainment or media that have been become the leaders uh, in the next form. And I think for sure that's going to happen here. I think Hollywood. Uh, has some interesting assets and in that they've got, uh, you know, known IP, which people uh, love. And so I think there will be great VR experiences created around Star Wars and Harry Potter and other things. But it's not going to be those companies that own that IP necessarily doing that. Got it. Um, and where I was going with that, though, was, you know, this is all around kind of industries producing content. However, you know, you look at the web, you look at mobile kind of previous computing platforms, um, Social media became dominant very quickly. Um, you know, power of network effects. People like to communicate with their friends. They like to share things about their lives. Um, Darshan, how, how do you think self-expression is going, going to work in VR? Like, are we going to be just sharing in the same way that we share photos and videos captured from our phones today? You know, flat media. Are we just going to be doing that with 360 videos as our phones get that capability? Or are there kind of other avenues of self-expression that VR opens up? It's hard to say, probably all of the above, uh, in the sense that uh, 360 content, uh, once it becomes extremely easy to film, extremely easy to capture for every consumer, uh, the way we capture with our phones any sort of photos, that becomes really easy to share. Uh, that becomes, but first, you have to make it really easy to capture, make it really easy to distribute. Uh, you have to solve some of those low lying problems first. Uh, but that whole range, like for big screen, it's a lot more about sharing your, your 2D content. So you might be working on something and you might be able to share it with a friend. It doesn't require 360 capture technology to, to catch up and go mainstream. Um, but in terms of like user generated content, allowing people to create kind of like what Minecraft has accomplished in the past decade, uh, allowing people to create their own virtual worlds and explore it with their friends, we might be a little early for that. Uh, in terms of user generated social media type functionality, um, we again might be too early for that. Um, it's hard to predict when it'll be ready for that. But if you look at the history of the internet, the web, and mobile, a lot of bundling was occurring in the early days where it wasn't completely user generated. It wasn't GeoCities super early on. It was a lot of, it was AOL. It was kind of bundled news before everybody could make their own website. It was few, uh, it was like major news websites that would, that you would visit first before you started making your own, uh, before WordPress or something. So hard to say, it might be a little early, but even today you can create some pretty cool stuff and share it with your friends. Got it. Um, and so, uh, one of the common concerns that I hear a lot when uh, I'm trying to you know, talk about how amazing VR is going to be uh, as it takes off is, yeah, but isn't it really isolating? 
Um, you know, you're wearing something that's literally, in the case of VR, AR, maybe not so much, but with VR in particular, you're wearing something that's literally blocking your view of the rest of the world around you, you know. And so people have, you know, understandable concerns, like, are we all going to be in our own kind of escapist fantasies, not interacting with each other? Um, from a storyteller's perspective, you know, uh, cinema, we go to the movie theater together. We sit on the couch and, uh, watch Netflix or catch up on Game of Thrones with our friends. Um, Jason, how do you think about, uh, cinematic uh, and social kind of coalescing in VR. I mean, to me, I think that the I, I think the bull case is that VR has the potential to be the inherently most social medium kind of a, of any form of technology that we've seen so far. Even with I the think, goggles. Even because I think, imagine you know, if you had the power to instead of just going to the movies with your friends, like what if you could actually be in the movies with your friends and right, you could each give each other. Uh, you know, unique superpowers and interact within a virtual environment. And so I think that if you look at where we are, I, I mean, we, we sort of think that media is social today, right? Because we can watch an NBA game or a, a football game and like have a tweet stream either, you know, on the side of it or on our phones. But imagine if you could actually be immersed in the whole experience and rather than, you know, needing a, a text-based metadata set of social interactions, if you could be physically immersed. In the environment, and I think actually, if, you know, if you look at what Darshan's doing with big screen, right? Uh, I mean, you can explain your product better than me, but it is like it is the most fun way to play video games with your friends, uh, doing it in a VR environment uh, versus versus the way we do it today. Yeah, and so really quickly because I want to keep on the social aspect a little bit, Darshan, could you maybe explain what big screen does for its users? Sure. Uh, so big screen puts you into a virtual world. Uh, you can invite your friends or your colleagues into it. Uh, you'll see your computer in front of you, uh, all of your existing apps, whether it's video games or uh, Netflix or whatever you have on your computer screen. Uh, and when you look over, you'll see your, your friends. They could be thousands of miles away, uh, but you'll see them. You'll see an avatar of them. It's like being in a living room or a conference room together with people that aren't there physically with you. Um, that's the, the social collaborative power of VR being applied to our day-to-day -day lives that we already do today. And so kind of expanding on that, um, I have a recommendation for everyone in the audience of a video you should check out. Uh, on YouTube later, find time to search for uh, Microsoft Research, Research Holoportation. Uh, there's a demo from Microsoft Research where basically they surround a room with cameras and depth sensors and scan people in and are able to then kind of teleport their holograms to different environments. And so you get this kind of social experience, but... Uh, it looks like they're in the room with you rather than making you, you know, put on the headset that completely blocks out the real world. And so I, I mentioned that um, to transition a little bit to AR um, because, uh, again, something that we hear a lot, even from people like Tim Cook at Apple, is you know they're more excited about augmented reality than virtual reality because it doesn't have that blocking out the real world. You actually get to make eye contact with people. With that said, AR is a couple years out, even relative to VR, in terms of difficulties around optics, in terms of computer vision. So as you're building virtual reality products and experiences today, how are you thinking about AR? What lessons that you're learning from virtual reality are going to apply to augmented reality as that you know, kind of emerges, maybe becomes more dominant for certain use cases? What transfers over and where do you have to start with fresh eyes? I think fundamentally what you're talking about is a medium that is 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 human experience like that 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 is the celluloid it is actual human experience that you perceive as human experience so ar is human experience in the place that you are vr is human experience in any any place that you could be transported um and i think what you're going to see in the in the long term especially with virtual reality is the the sort of democratization of human experience in the same way that the internet led to the democratization of information so you can I mean, it sounds like hype, but right. we're in the early stages of it right now where you can feel like you are anywhere. And and because the tech industry, we, we love to come up with new acronyms and more jargon to throw at people. Uh, there's a couple other uh, terms that people are, you know, kind of talking about a lot in this space. Uh, mixed reality, the idea of kind of um, merging virtual objects and augmented experiences together, kind of a nebulous blend. Uh, Intel talks about... Um, yeah, uh, merged reality. So virtual reality experiences where it's scanning in the room. And so it, you know, puts, uh, you know, if I was wearing a headset, it would project virtual avatars onto all of you so that I still feel like I'm kind of present here, even though I'm in a virtual world. Um, do you spend much time thinking about these kinds of blended experiences? Um, or, you know, 
how do you even think about like the relative mix that makes sense to go with um, as you're building things? I, I mean, I, I think your your point is right, right, which is that um, the way it'll likely play out is that th- th- there's going to be a broad spectrum, right, from a, a purely synthetic virtual world like the Matrix all the way up to uh, you know the, the point that you open with of us all having our Facebook and LinkedIn profiles floating above our heads uh, in meetings. And I think that the uh, I mean the the good thing is that. Um, we're, we're sort of in the stage of the medium now uh, where, where everybody's working on the underlying infrastructure technologies and, and uh, kind of the first experiences around those. And it doesn't matter uh, you know, if it's AR or VR, uh, the, the investments that you need to make right now and the opportunities that that, that creates, I think, are exactly the same. Uh, and and what will happen, I think, is that as both uh, mediums mature, we'll start to see uh, them diverge and, and see new applications that may work better in one versus the other. Uh, and, and then others that work well across the Right. And uh, incorporating even more mediums, you know, uh, today virtual reality is kind of growing out of gaming uh, with things like what Within is working on. You know, film is contributing to a lot of the content that's available. Um, in terms of, I guess the correct term would maybe be asymmetric experiences. So people who are in virtual reality, you know, some of the people involved in the experience, but other people are on their phones also engaging with them. When does it make sense to build something asymmetric? And when does, when does it make sense to build something where, you know, it's VR, AR from the outset and you don't compromise on that? <laughs> Um, you know, that, that, I think that's like kind of a philosophical debate. That's a question I was just asking you. In the group. Yeah, I know. And so um, I think that was a fun discussion. So I'd love to, I'd love to kind of uh, rehash some of it, maybe. I, I mean, I, I personally, I think you should build things that are the most inclusive to the most amount of people that they can have compelling experiences with it. And and when you get into the finer details, it really depends on the experiences that you're building. Um, I think that there's people are looking at this medium right now as it's either an evolution of cinema or it's an evolution of video games. At first, it was an evolution of video games, and I think that the, the reason that was was because the people making it were all video gamers. It was like what Mark was talking about at the the opening yesterday with the Edison thought that the phonograph would be used for sermons because that was his world. That's what he that like that was his reality, and the people that were building virtual reality are, were gamers. So everything was is going to be about games, and then slowly we started to see cinematic VR bubble up in the last few years. And then it's like, okay, well, maybe it's the evolution of movies. And it's actually, I don't think it's either of those because I think it's its own new medium in its own right. Um, it, it will take things from each of them and it will evolve. Like what Jason was saying, uh, that the format is undefined. That's a really important thing to understand about this medium. It makes it actually different than other mediums is if you look at cinema, for instance, you have the format is birthed at the, at the birth of the technology. You have a sequence of rectangles played one after another. That's birthed with the motion picture camera and the motion picture projector. That format does not change over the lifespan of the medium. The language of storytelling in the form of a feature film or a television show or digital video or UGC, that does evolve. That does change, but the format always stays the same. What's different about virtual reality is the format is fluid. So you, and you see it changing on a bi-monthly basis where you're now able to tell a new kind of story because and the act, so the just, actual format has changed. To ground that a little bit, what kinds of specific changes un, you know, unlock new types of experiences? Like what kinds of improvements to the pl- underlying platforms kind of drive those ca- new capabilities? Well, it's, a, it's really it's about levels of immersion and it's about your interactivity with the world around you. So right now you have a real-time rendered world that does not look real that you can interact with or you have a, a, a photographed um, uh, experience that is photorealistic and that people look human and you can, at the moment, you can't walk around the room. 